Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to slowly get started with our usual announcements at the beginning. Um, apologies for the technical problem um, and the fact that the link was arriving late into your inboxes. So I know that people are slowly joining. So I shall start the meeting um, with the usual announcements at the beginning and hope that everyone can join in time. Okay, so welcome everybody to the final ordinary meeting of the RES during 2021. Um, and I'm pleased to see people are now joining for today's programme. And as always, it's set to be a good one. And we have two great speakers joining us this afternoon. So first of all, just the usual housekeeping. Um, this meeting is taking place via a webinar. And hopefully, if you look at the top left of your screen, you will see a small green shield. And that symbol means you're using the most up to date version of Zoom and that it is secure. And I also do need to advise you um, that this meeting is being recorded. So as always, after the presentations, you can ask questions, um, but as you will be muted, I would ask you please to use the chat facility, which is found at the bottom of your screen. And then your questions will go to the panelists. And today those questions will be read out by a member of council, um, our A Secretary, Dr Shona Urquhart. So thank you to Shona for joining us um, this afternoon. OK, one um, important deadline to announce before we get on with our programme. Um, the deadline relates to the RES prizes for the best PhD theses, theses in astronomy and geophysics submitted during 2021. And these are the prizes for the best theses in astronomy and astrophysics, the Michael Penston Prize, Solar System Sciences and Geophysics, the Keith Runcorn Prize, and the Instrumentation Prize, the Patricia Tompkins Prize. So the closing date for nominations for those awards, uh, which each carry a cash prize of £1,000 and the opportunity to make a presentation at a future ordinary meeting, will be the 31st of January 2022. So please do consider nominating uh, recently submitted PhD theses. Okay, so on to the main part of our programme then today. Um, I'm delighted to first of all introduce Dr. Cassandra Hall. And Dr. Cassandra Hall is the recipient of the Winton A Award. And just to give a quick introduction, uh, Dr. Hall is an assistant professor of computational astrophysics at the University of Georgia, USA. And she is primar primarily a computational astrophysicist using simulations to interpret and understand observational data. Dr. Hall earned her doctorate at the University of Edinburgh in 2017 and worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Leicester and then became one of two people in the inaugural class of Winton Exoplanet Fellows from 2018. And that's a programme which supports outstanding postdoctoral researchers working in exoplanet research. Dr Hall relocated to the University of Georgia in 2020, where she now leads an exoplanet and planet formation research group. She was awarded the University of Georgia's Lilly Teaching Fellowship in 2021 for dedication to teaching excellence with a commitment to equitable practices in teaching. So today, Dr. Hall is going to be speaking to us about planet formation, substructure and gravitational instability in protoplanetary accretion disks. So over to you, Cass. Hello, everybody. I'm um, just checking everybody can see my screen OK. Yes, that looks great. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about um, planet formation, substructure and gravitational instability in protoplanetary accretion disks. And it's such an honour to be here as well. Thank you so much for, for having me to speak. So just to outline the talk, I'm going to begin with a really a very broad motivation about why studying exoplanets and protoplanetary disks is exciting. And I'm going to explain what gravitational instability is and the role we think it may play in the evolution of protoplanetary disks. And then I'm going to discuss simulations and observations, how they interlink and how this is really the core of my research. And then I'm going to look to the future as well with probing planet formation with the square kilometer array. So this image is of the Chajnata Plateau in the Atacama Desert in northern Chile. 
It's the site of ALMA. ALMA is a radio telescope, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array. And this instrument, which is actually an array of these antennas that you can see here, has revealed to us a whole level of planet formation. You can see from this image that our night sky is filled with stars. There are about 400 billion stars in our galaxy and about 400 billion galaxies in the universe, which means that there are about 10 to the 23 exoplanets in our universe. If statistically speaking, there are on average at least one planet around every star. And we know this is the case from exoplanet search missions, for example, such as Kepler. So we're at a point where we can not only search um, for exoplanets, but also search for them as they are forming around their host stars. And this is, in some sense, equivalent to kind of looking back at the formation of our own solar system four billion years ago to try and work out what happened, although it is happening today. So looking at these, at these systems, we can try to answer some of the biggest questions that humanity has, such as how did Earth form? You know, Earth is special, nothing else in our solar system is, is really like it. What were the conditions that allowed Earth to form? Why do we have so much water, which is an essential ingredient for life? These questions are really important in understanding the place of humanity in the universe. How did life begin on Earth? If we can search for signs of prebiotic chemistry, molecules such as formamide, for example, which are precursors to some of the essential chemicals needed for life, this may help us understand how life makes this leap from inert to self-replicating molecules. Recent surveys, for example, with ALMA, have shown that planet-forming disks are teeming with the molecules needed to build complex biological compounds. And perhaps the biggest question philosophically, theologically for society is, are we alone in the universe? This is an important and impossible question to answer until we have conclusive evidence, of course, of life elsewhere. But the first step is to try to quantify how many small rocky planets are out there and then try to understand how many of them may be anything like Earth. With the launch of new space missions such as JWST, we may find some answers that go some way towards helping us quantify the probability of life elsewhere in the universe. So we have here something that I like to call the exoplanet architecture. And you can see that there are many planets for which there is no solar system analog. There are planets many times the size of Jupiter, closer to their host star than Mercury is in our own solar system. We have lava worlds that orbit their host, planet, host star in a few hours with temperatures in the thousands of Kelvin. There is this huge amount of diversity. And one of the most pressing questions is how do we explain this diversity? How do we explain the huge variety that we see in the exoplanet population. What is it that's driving these differences? Exoplanets form in protoplanetary accretion disks. The disk determines the most fundamental exoplanet properties, which is the mass, since the mass basically decides if it's going to be small and rocky like Earth or large and gaseous like Jupiter, but also the distance from the host star, which therefore determines the surface temperature. So exoplanets form in these protoplanetary accretion disks. So the dark rings that you can see here are carved out by forming exoplanets. The conditions inside these disks, which is where exoplanets form, decide the most fundamental properties of these exoplanets. So the issue here is that we have um, a timescale problem. The accretion disks, when we see them, are generally very, very young, at most about a million years old and sometimes significantly less. But fully formed solar systems, such as our own, are around a billion years old. So the question here is, what happens in the middle? So to figure this out, we need computational and simulational models of protoplanetary accretion disks. So I have here a couple of movies from some simulations. One on the left-hand side, the object is self-gravitating and it's kind of settled into this self-regulating state. And on the right hand side, it is collapsed to form some gravitationally bound objects. Now, these simulations are looped. They're around 3000 uh, years in, in Earth time. And the key here is that we can't observe real systems on these evolutionary timescales. So the evolution and formation of planets and their environments happens on longer timescales than we can observe. We therefore need models in order to interpret observations. So if we want to understand 
the diversity in the exoplanet architecture, then we need models of planet formation and accretion disks in order to do so. Okay, so moving on to gravitational instability in protoplanetary disks. Accretion disks are ubiquitous in astrophysics. They are found on every rung of the cosmic ladder, all the way from active galactic nuclei down to accretion disks surrounding planets. And they exist because they form from a collapsing cloud that has some latent angular momentum due to velocity and isotropy, and angular momentum must be conserved during the collapse, and this is the only shape that conserves this angular momentum. So what happens in these accretion disks is that mass moves inwards to form the central protostar. But in order to conserve angular momentum, angular momentum must also be redistributed outwards to allow mass to flow inwards. So this happens through some torque, and a torque is just a rate of change of angular momentum. So the purpose of an accretion disk is for mass to move inwards so that the central protostar can grow. We have built up um, a classification of protoplanetary disks based on spectral energy distributions that correspond to the evolution of the disk. They begin as a collapsing cloud of gas before coming more and more disk-like as they accrete the majority of their envelope before finally becoming debris disks and they kind of stop reprocessing any light into longer wavelengths once most of the envelope is gone. So these things are really evolving objects. Over the course of their lifetime, they shift a lot of mass onto the central protostar. So equation one here is the evolution equation for disk surface density under action of internal angular momentum transport. So the surface density profile of these objects evolves over time due to internal angular momentum transport. But angular momentum transport can only come from a torque, a rate of change of angular momentum. In order to have this torque, we need some sort of viscosity, as shown in equation two, to basically provide this redistribution of angular momentum. So one of the biggest open problems in accretion disk physics is, what is the origin of this viscosity? Which basically is a turbulence that drives the angular momentum transport. One possibility is turbulence from gravitational instability. So this is set by the tomb ray parameter. For gravitational instability, the tomb ray parameter needs to be about less than two for gravitational instability to set in. What you basically have is you have pressure, well, it comes from temperature, sound speed, stabilizing shorter wavelength perturbations. You also have rotation, stabilizing longer wavelength perturbations, and all of this is acting against gravity. You also have a very useful expression, this alpha parameter, which basically quantifies the amount of gravitational stress in the disk, but it is also basically quantifying the efficiency of angular momentum transport. So this is a little bit obtuse. Okay, so what does this actually mean? It means that a more massive disk, if you want to have it settled into this quasi steady state where the spirals are continually replenishing and ebbing, you basically have a more efficient cooling and you have more dramatic spirals because of this to remain in this balanced state with the heating. On the other hand, if your disk is less massive, you'll have weaker heating and therefore you require weaker cooling in order to remain balanced. And then you will therefore have these weaker spirals. So a good question is what happens when these objects are no longer quasi steady and heating and cooling stop being balanced? So we have here a shearing sheet simulation. You basically look at a very small region of the disk. You pick a fiducial point that is co-rotating with the bulk of the disk. You expand your equations of motion in first order and you basically solve for the perturbations. And it just allows you to look at this deviation from the bulk motion. So it's really just local conditions in the disk. So what is interesting is that if the disk cools on a time scale that is more rapid than it can collisionally heat itself up, it's going to collapse and fragment and form gravitationally bound objects, which is what has happened on the left hand side that you can see here. On the right hand side, if the cooling is sufficiently slow, you do not get fragmentation because it is able to heat itself up on comparable time scales. Okay, now moving on to simulations and observations. So as I just mentioned, if a disk cools faster than it can collisionally heat itself up, it will undergo fragmentation into gravitationally bound objects. 
So you can see in these simulations on the left hand side, this is what has happened. It has been able to undergo fragmentation and collapse to form these objects. On the right hand side, you have much slower cooling and it's kind of settled into this quasi steady self regulating state. One of the key questions here is, can this fragmentation mechanism be a planet formation pathway? So we investigated this by running a suite of simulations. So what is interesting is that to some extent, fragmentation can be a stochastic process. All of these disks qualitatively had identical initial conditions. They had the same mass, same surface density profile, same temperature profile. The only thing that differed was something called a random number seed used to initialize the placement of the actual fluid elements. So what that means is there's just a very slight change in the noise distribution in the pattern, the underlying conditions. So qualitatively, they're identical, quantitatively very slightly different, but this is only really due to noise. So what is really interesting is despite the identical physical initial conditions qualitatively, these simulations had different outcomes. Although they all fragmented, they formed different numbers of fragments at varying mass and also at varying separation from the host star. So we took these simulations and compared them to some population synthesis models. So these models make simplifying assumptions about the physics so that we can run hundreds of thousands of them. Generally speaking, we parameterize the disk into one dimension, for example, so that we can run many of them for a long time. I've plotted the results here. So the blue lines are the hydrodynamics results from the realistic 3D simulation. And the red is the population synthesis model that used these parameterized equations and these 1D assumptions. Now, looking at the mass, it was a little bit difficult to get a clump identification algorithm that did a good job of detecting all of the mass in the clump without making spurious detections, which is why the mass peak has slightly shifted to the left relative to the population synthesis model. But overall, the mass is kind of in good agreement, taking this into account. But what is really interesting is that in both cases, what we find is that we preferentially kind of form pretty massive objects, typically the genes mass and then higher, often pretty far away from the central star. These things will be scattered out to hundreds of AU and even further. So a really good question to ask is, when does this fragmentation happen? When is it likely? So far, there is not a huge amount of data for objects undergoing fragmentation right now, but it certainly seems to be possible at two extremes. For example, around a 40 solar mass star, which is a very, very, very massive object, and also around really low mass binaries, a one solar mass binary. So this begs the question, when does fragmentation happen? So a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh, James Cadman, uh, led a study to look at this by looking at simulations. So what he did was he ran a suite of simulations that all have the same disk to star mass ratio. So this means that the kind of gravitational stresses in the disk, for example, will be similar across these scales. But what is interesting is that as we increase the central mass of the object, but we hold steady the disk to star mass ratio, so in all cases it's 50%, we find that fragmentation is very heavily favored around higher mass stars, even for the same disk to star mass ratio. Now, this GIF is one of my favorite GIFs in all of existence. This system shows the HR8799 system. These observations span seven years and they were taken with the Keck telescope. The central object is a 1.5 solar mass star and based on the previous results, for the same sort of disk to star mass ratios, it is more likely to undergo fragmentation. What is really interesting about this system is that you have these really massive planets, five to seven times the mass of Jupiter, forming very, very, very far away from their host star. Now, in the classical core accretion paradigm of planet formation, where planets form kind of slowly through coalescence from grains to pebbles and so on, it's very difficult to form these objects one, there shouldn't be enough kind of refractory material this far away from the star, um, but also it's an issue of time scale. So what is interesting here is that gravitational instability offers an explanation to kind of solve this paradox for the very massive planets very far away from their central star. 
And this is consistent with observations more broadly. For example, uh, the VLT Narco Large Program was combined with an additional 12 surveys for a sample of 199 FGK stars in total. And that they found that in this sample, between 1 and 8.6% of this sample uh, contained a planet that was consistent with having formed through gravitational instability at a 95% confidence level. So what this tells us is that despite GI not being common, it is still statistically consistent with it being the dominant planet formation mechanism for these wide orbit massive systems such as HR 8799. Okay, so just to introduce these image, the top are scattered light images, so 1.6 microns. Um, in scattered light, you basically are only seeing the surface features at about three scale heights above the midplane, and you can see these beautiful spirals. On the bottom, we have millimeter continuum images. So this is 1.3 millimeter, and you are probing much more of the disk and kind of going down to the midplane in this case. And the key question is, could these spirals be due to gravitational instability? So we ran some simulations to try and work this out. So here we have simulations that increase in mass from top to bottom. So the left is the surface density. The center column is polarized intensity image scaled to R squared. So you basically release a bunch of photon packets from the central star and allow it to propagate through the medium. And then the right is a synthetic image. So you basically convolve with a Gaussian with a point spread function, matching whatever observation you're trying to reproduce. In, in this case, uh, we had a point spread function with a full width half max of 0.05 arc seconds, which is kind of comparable to, to sphere on the VLT. So we compared these images um, to those taken in scattered light. And what we find is that we can explain the spiral morphology in these observations using gravitational instability. But there are some strict caveats that must be met. The disk needs to be massive. The spirals must be compact and the accretion rate must be high. Point one is particularly interesting because the disk mass is something that is really, really difficult to pin down. We often make assumptions based on continuum observations, which probes, um, probes the dust. And then we make some assumption about uh, dust to gas mass ratio. So one of the problems that we have been faced with is the morphological similarity between gravitational instability and planets. Both gravitational instability and planets can explain spirals. If we could pin down the disk mass and be sure of the disk mass in this case, we would be able to rule out one or the other, but this is very, very difficult to do. So the morphologically, they're too similar. The disk mass is highly uncertain, and so we need another way. This is the brightness temperature map of HD 97048, and it was an object that was found to have a planet through kinematics. So on the left-hand side, you can see this ordinary Keplerian butterfly feature with no perturbation. But on the right-hand side, you see this velocity kink, which is a distinctive elbow-like shape caused by um, the spiral wake of the planet. So what happens is the spiral wake of the planet perturbs the gas velocity radially inwards and radially outwards at the location of the planet. So these spiral density waves, of course, are kind of present throughout the disk, but because the disk is viscous, it kind of washes them out as you increase around in azimuth. So they're really strongest at the location of the planet. But what is interesting here is looking at these simulations of gravitational instability, you can see that there is no single point at which the velocity is perturbed. There are GI spirals throughout the disk. So we took this simulation and ran a radiative transfer calculation to get molecular line channel maps. So what we found was something called the GI wiggle. It is this very strong signature of gravitational instability. It is a velocity signal, so you have to look at it using, using gas. In this case, it was 13 CO. It is present at all azimuths, and it is also independent of viewing angle, and it was robust to rotation as well. So it's a really, really good signature to search for. But have we detected this GI wiggle? So the answer is, is yes. In C18O 
J equals three to two transition of the Elias 227 system, we very clearly saw this GI wiggle. So it's really nice that we've had observational confirmation of this prediction from simulations. So now looking towards the future and thinking about probing planet formation with the SKA. The earliest stage of planet formation is grain growth. If we want to look at the population of pebbles, which are roughly centimeter sized grains, we need to be observing at wavelengths of kind of two to three centimeters or so. So I've been involved in the Cradle of Life working group for the SKA. Um, and the Cradle of Life goal is to understand planet forming conditions at longer wavelengths. So the SKA, the Square Kilometer Array, is gonna be the world's largest radio telescope. It's gonna have thousands of dishes and millions of low frequency antenna. Science observations are currently predicted to begin in 2028. So in this, in this work, we presented the first predictions of what the Square Kilometer Array was gonna see when observing planet containing or planet forming forming disks. So what is interesting is that with planets, you get this, these kind of spirals that you can see in the gas here, but what's tend to happen in the dust instead is you get this ring-like structure because the dust becomes trapped at local pressure maxima. So if you're observing at different wavelengths, if you're looking you know, at micron wavelengths, you would just be looking at the dust that is well coupled to the gas. You're gonna see a very different morphology at these different wavelengths. So on the left-hand side here, we have a synthetic image made by simulations. It's an interferometric image reconstruction and it relies on estimating the real on-sky brightness distribution from the directly observed visibilities. But there are a lot of problems with this. For example, visibilities are only finitely sampled. You need to apply deconvolution algorithms with nonlinear effects. Image pixels tend to suffer from you know, poorly constrained correlated noise. There's probably many more. So what happens is you end up with a bunch of artifacts and you require very, very long integration times in order to retain image fidelity, in this case, a thousand hours uh, on source integration. So instead, what we can do is we can extract information directly from the visibility plane to bypass these problems. So it's a bit technical, but essentially what we do is we assume the disk is made up of infinitesimally narrow rings, which when we Fourier transform into visibility space, are just zero order Bessel functions. And then the intensity distribution is a summation over Gaussians, each with an amplitude A and a width sigma. And these are also modulated by a sinusoidal function with a spatial frequency rho. And what this means is we can add radial substructure and do this many different times with various spatial frequencies. And then we can use an MCMC algorithm coupled with Bayesian statistics to determine the best fit intensity profile. So it's a little bit complicated, but what that means is as long as we are clever about what we do with our data, we do not lead super long in integration times. You know, we can reduce something initially needing 1000 hours in order to retain image fidelity down to 10 hours by using this clever technique. So something else that we hope to do with the SKA is to search for prebiotic molecules, which are the precursors to life. So formamide is one such molecule. From simulations involving chemical networks, we expect these things to be present in forming fragments and from, you know, um, recent uh, ALMA observations as well, we see that these, these molecules are kind of teeming in, in disks, but we can't specifically look for formamide at those wavelengths. So this is something that we want to search for uh, using the SKA. Formamide is, you know, a big precursor to nucleic acids, nuclear bases, sugars, and amino acids. It's really one of the fundamental building blocks of life. So to summarize, understanding why the known exoplanet population looks the way it does is one of the most interesting um, open problems in astrophysics. And our best bet is to understand the environment in which they form, which means we need to do simulations of planet formation. So protoplanetary disks are the site of exoplanet formation. If we want to understand the most fundamental properties, we need to understand protoplanetary disks. Gravitational instability may be the dominant source of turbulence and the reason that disks evolve at all at the earliest stages of a disk lifetime, so it's likely to be very important. GI is unlikely to form most planets, but may form most of the very massive planets. We can now determine if spirals are due to gravitational instability thanks to discovery of this GI wiggle. Now we have confirmation of this. And looking to the future, um, SKA has really promising capabilities for the earliest stages of planet formation and also for searching for prebiotic molecules. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Kaz, for that wonderful uh, presentation. And thanks so much for sharing your work with us this afternoon. Um, I'm going to hand over to Shona to see if there are any questions coming in, either by the Q&A or the chat. Hi, thanks, um, Emma. And also, thank you. That was a wonderful talk. But to be honest, we don't have any questions. And I think that's because you presented it all so, <laughs> so well and so, so clearly. Um, if our attendees don't have any questions, do our panellists want to ask anything? I, I wouldn't mind asking a question if that's okay. Oh, I think we'll allow you as president, <laughs> president <laughs> then, Kirk. <laughs> Probably a very naive question, but you mentioned about measuring um, the mass um, of, the, of the disc, of the uh, accretion disc, and how challenging that is. I suppose my question is sort of, you know, how could that be improved or what is it that has to happen in order to help improve that estimate? So that's a great question. There's a few things, um, you know, trying to make inferences from going from the continuum and making assumptions about the dust to gas mass ratio is not great. Getting gas observations directly is better, but this is often hindered by foreground contamination or contamination from the envelope. Um, a new technique that seems pretty promising is basically using um, gas data to get rotation curves and fitting the rotation curves, um, including both the gravitational potential for the self-gravity, the Keplerian component, and the radial pressure component as well. Doing that, we've actually been able to recover um, the disk mass for the Elias-227 system, for example. Um, so higher spatial and spectral resolution um, for these, you know, uh, for fitting that is, is probably the best way forward. Actually, we do have a question if I can interrupt. Um, so hopefully this is a simple one for you to answer. Um, so you mentioned about the coalescence of pebbles. Mm -hmm. What time scales do the pebbles form from the gas? And that's from Stanley. That's a great question. Um, you know, and it's, it's one that it's kind of uncertain. You know, traditionally in the core accretion paradigm, it takes, you know, millions of years um but with some you know there's new evidence that other things happen such as streaming instabilities in this case it could be much more rapid and um, the exact time scale would depend on the properties of the disc like the local gas density and um, what the local dust density is at the time that these things kind of um kind of occur so it's it's largely kind of quite uncertain um and it's it's one of the things that it's a very active area of research at the moment Cool, thank you. That was a great answer. Um, and I'll hand you back to Emma to introduce our okay. next Thanks, thanks very much. And thanks again, Cass, for that fantastic talk. And I think in the interest of time, and obviously we're running a little bit late, we will move on to our second speaker, but thank you very much again for that wonderful talk. Thank you. Okay, so next I would like to bring in our second speaker, Dr. Ziri Yanzi from uh, UCL. And um, Dr. Yanzi is part of the team who received the RAS Group Award uh, for Astronomy um, and is part of the Event Horizon Telescope team. So just by way of introduction then, Dr. Yanzi is currently a UKRI Stephen Hawking Fellow in Astrophysics at University College London, previously a Leverhulme Early Career Fellow at the same location, and has been working with the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration since 2014. Uh, Dr. Yanzi has been uh, developing and performing supercomputer simulations of black holes and horizon scale black hole imaging, enabling comparison with and interpretation of observational images of black holes. He is one of just three UK scientists on the Event Horizon Telescope team and is a co-recipient of the National Science Foundation Diamond Achievement Award, the 2020 Breakthrough Prize for Fundamental Physics, and of course the RAS Group Award A. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Yanzi, who's going to be speaking to us about the first image of a black hole from the Event Horizon Telescope. Over to you, Ziri, thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. I hope you can all see my slides. Great. You can hear me loud and clear. Absolutely. Wonderful. OK, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, hello, everybody. Um, it's a genuine pleasure for me uh, to be giving this talk today to the, uh, to the Royal Astronomical Society, very much on behalf of the uh, Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. And as part of the team, I'd, I'd like to say 
and on behalf of the team, thank you very much for for this award. It, it's uh, it's uh, it means a lot to us, and it's uh, we feel uh, 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 very appreciative of, of this recognition. So um, I'm tasked with giving an overview of a very very broad project that spans many different areas of uh, modern astrophysics. And I come from a background as a theorist, so I work on uh, theoretical calculations and numerical simulations, computational calculations of black holes and uh, how they behave, how light behaves around them, how matter moves around them and so on. So I'll, I'll be approaching this from that perspective. And what I'll be trying to do is, is by the end of this talk, hopefully give you uh, a flavor of what this image that you see here on this title slide uh, actually represents. So this is an image of the accretion flow around a black hole. In particular, actually, it's a supermassive black hole. It's the one in our galactic center, Sagittarius A star. Um, and you can see that it's very asymmetric and there's all these uh, different bright, turbulent features. My hope is by the end of this talk, that'll make a lot more sense as to what it means and what we can learn from this. Uh, and so um, just below a few of my, my funders and of course, um, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration itself. So without further ado, um, quick outline of my talk. So I've broadly divided the talk into three main components. So the first is uh, approaching the question of what a black hole actually is. Um, what is a black hole? How do we see a black hole? And so on. Uh, once we understand this, um, one of the questions that one has to ask oneself in, in, in undertaking this is where should we look? And it turns out that you need, of course, sources which have a very uh, as large an angular size as possible to resolve. And so uh, the black hole well, I should say the candidate supermassive black hole in a galactic center and the supermassive black hole in uh, M87 are two sources that are prime targets for the EHT collaboration. Um, the next step is, of course, how do we go about seeing this? And this is really the sort of heart of what the EHT accomplished. And it's an enormous technological feat and uh, achievement. And finally, and most importantly for us as scientists, uh, we're tasked with trying to address the questions that surround this, this image and what indeed do we learn from this scientifically. So um, this is the image itself uh, made by this collaboration, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. But first and foremost, I should say that beyond telescopes, it's actually, uh, this, is, this is a group of people. Uh, these are uh, scientists from all across the globe, more than 60 institutes uh, spanning, I believe actually six continents um, working together in synergy from many different areas of, 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 uh, of uh, science. And actually, we have philosophers too, we have system engineers, we have, of course, observers, we have theorists, we have experimentalists, and so on. And it, it really is uh, a synergistic collaborative effort. And the picture you see here, actually, is from our collaboration meeting, which was unfortunately, again, virtual this year due to COVID, that actually finished just this morning. So this is a sort of a a mosaic of, 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 of uh, pictures of participants. Uh, and so we are a, a large diverse group who work closely together. And of course, the EHT itself is actually an array of telescopes rather than one telescope. So in 2017, which is when we recorded the data, which, which resulted in this uh, now famous black hole image, um, it was recorded um, with actually seven telescopes. You'll see eight here. It was actually the first seven on the right here. And the eighth one, which is the South Pole Telescope, it took part in uh, measurements for calibrations and calibration sources, but wasn't part of the, uh, the recording of the Sagittarius A, A star data itself. Now, um, I will show a few movies later on about um, the EHT network itself and how it went about doing this. Um, but as, as you can see, the array is, in a sense, actually rather small to begin with, and yet we were able to achieve this. And I hope in the next uh, few minutes, I, I'm able to communicate that point and how we went about that. Um, so the EHT published a series of papers in April 27, uh, 2019 on this. We published six papers, which are listed here. And I've underlined three, which I touch upon in this talk. Uh, there, there simply just isn't time to, to go through all of this. So, I'll be focusing on the meaning of the shadow of the supermassive black hole itself, so that's paper one, uh, and how that's connected to general relativity and our uh, uh, understanding of it. Then I will look uh, at some of the results that we uh, worked on in paper five, which is a sort of theory paper, where we did a lot of com com computing simulations and radiation transport calculations of these simulations to try and reconcile um, 
what we were seeing with, with our, our theoretical predictions and to see if we could extract certain parameters of the black hole, which I'll touch upon soon. And finally, uh, we were actually able to impose a, a, a mass constraint for M87, which was independent uh, of uh, other, other measurements. This was, a, this was a strong field GR constraint, and that will be something that I talk about as well. We actually published two more papers just this year in April, which I unfortunately won't have time to go into today on the polarization structure of M87 itself, but these are really important papers because they, they, they actually shed a, a really uh, new light into the magnetic structure of the accretion flow, and it has actually been extremely constraining. Um, and if you have any questions about that, um, I'd be very happy to talk about that after the talk. So this was the image itself, and we published this on the 10th of April, 2019, and we were really overwhelmed by the reception that it received. It was on the front pages of almost every national newspaper around the world. Uh, and it had a reach of over 3 billion people. Uh, this was uh, really um, uh, caught us all by surprise. And what I wanted to show was some of the sort of interesting interpretations from the general public that were uh, going around that, that day. And uh, I've literally shown my favorite three here. So the first is uh, the eye of Sauron or uh, uh, fear. And in a sense that, that these three images I'm about to show represent fundamental tenets of human nature. So we have fear. And then we have food, so the giant cosmic bagel. And finally, my favorite. My slides frozen, sorry. And you can see it now, it's the giant cosmic kitty cat. And there we go. Uh, so we have fear, food, and felines. The, the third one being my favorite, and of course, this is a completely unrealistic because there are two black holes. But nonetheless, uh, you know, uh, jokes aside, um, what this really demonstrates is how this result resonated with the with the public, and of course, uh, there is a, there's a deep fascination with uh, with objects like black holes, and they are you know very much in the vernacular. So, we've been tasked with trying to explain what this means. Now, apologise, my slides don't seem to want to change. Okay. So what I'd like to start with, first of all, is provide a very, very brief history of black holes themselves. So if we draw a timeline, I, I was fascinated to learn back in 2019 that they actually go all the way back to 1783 when a chap called Reverend John Michel, who is a, a British uh, polymath and I believe a fellow of uh, Queen's College in Cambridge, uh, proposed the notion of a dark star. So he was around at the time where Newton's corpuscular theory of light, uh, 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 Newton's gravity and the corpuscular theory of light was the pregnant uh, framework for people looked at these things and he posited the notion of this dark star, so an object that was sufficiently compact that the, the radiation that would be emitted from its surface couldn't escape because of the, the, the strength of that, uh, of its gravity. Uh, and actually uh, Laplace, bless him on Laplace, uh, came up with a similar notion towards the end of um, that century, uh, but um, this was lost to time and forgotten for uh, several centuries uh, because of course we had Thomas Young and the double slit experiment and this whole wave particle duality issue with light, which would of course not rec reconciled until the advent of quantum mechanics. So when we fast forward to 1915, of course, we had Albert Einstein and his theory of general relativity 10 years after his theory of special relativity. I'll talk about that briefly in a moment. And he put forward a set of uh, what are called field equations, which describe um, curved space time. And nobody thought that these would be solved. They're incredibly complex uh, partial differential equations. And actually, in the very same year, published shortly the following year, Karl Schwarzschild uh, found a solution for a non-rotating st star. They weren't known as black holes back then. Uh, fast forward many years and a lot of important mathematical uh, background and developments, which I gloss over here. And um, at a meeting of the American Astronomical Society in 1967, John Archibald Wheeler, to those of us who work in gravitation, is one of the godfathers, uh, authored one of the, the sort of cornerstone books on the subject. Uh, coined the term black hole and before then it didn't really exist and I mention this simply because it's a little bit misleading because black holes aren't black of course they can radiate a minuscule amount of, of um, black body radiation Hawking radiation and they're not holes in fact they're not even physical objects because a hole you, you can fill a black hole if you dump more and more matter onto it it'll actually grow in size uh, anyway so moving forwards into the 1960s and beyond there was there's the growing Body of indirect evidence for their existence. And prior to this, they were considered very exotic objects. And you're a little bit crazy to be, to be working on this. Uh, but with the discovery of things like X-ray binaries, 
uh, and of course other compact objects like uh, pulsars and neutron stars in general. And finally, uh, the, the observations of orbital motions of, in, in particular in our galactic center of the so-called S stars uh, and watching them move around this central supermassive compact object. So here's a video here showing this, it's about to play, there we go. And the one in the center that you really see uh, in a moment, uh, I believe is on the yellow track, this is S2 or S02. And this has been observed for more than one orbit now. And these are, these are stars, they aren't comets. And of course we can work, work backwards from Kepler's laws and so on. And we can obtain a constraint and on the, the mass of the central object. And that mass is of the order of four, little over four million solar masses. And that's all constrained to within a region smaller, I believe, than the orbital radius of Mercury. So it's very compact indeed. And of course, this is a very um, significant simply because um, this region is, is evidently so compact that it must, it, it presumably has to be something like a supermassive black hole. And of course, uh, just last year, and we were very pleased as a community to see this, the Nobel Prize for Physics was awarded to, or well, half to Roger Penrose for, for his work on the stability of black holes and the other half to Reinhard Gensel and um, Andrea Goetz for their work that you're seeing in this movie below the observations of these S stars and their work on constraining um, the fact that this is actually, uh, well, I should say a discovery rather of a supermassive compact object at the center of the galaxy. And the onus being on compact object rather than black hole, because of course it isn't definitive proof of a black hole, just something very compact. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment because when moving forward now to 2015, and of course we had the detection and discovery of gravitational waves. And this was incredibly important. Um, for the community as a whole, because uh, this is a key experimental validation of uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity. And uh, prior to this, of course, they were, they were a theoretical prediction. And of course, the Nobel Prize uh, went to, um, to Barry Barish and uh, Kip Thorne and um, Rainer Weiss for this uh, back in 2017. Sorry, can I just interrupt you briefly? I'm very sorry to interrupt your flow, um, but we're, we're not seeing your slides change. So oh my goodness. Um, okay. I'm sorry about, I, I don't think it's just me. I've just checked. So um, mm -hmm. we're still on the brief history slide. Oh, I see. Okay. Sorry okay, well, that. I'll, okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, well, suffice to say, I'll skip to the next slide. Um, that so far there hasn't been direct evidence uh, for uh, the existence of black holes themselves. We've seen a lot of indirect evidence. It's mounting, it's almost overwhelming, but nonetheless, it's indirect. And so what the EHT has really uh, tasked itself with doing is obtaining a picture. So direct observational confirmation of a black hole, imaging the, the structures that we can detect uh, within the direct vicinity of the event horizon. So I hope, Emma, you can see this slide now. No, I'm sorry. As far as I'm concerned, we're still stuck on your brief history slide. Are you able to sort of back out of your slideshow again, like you did earlier? Yes, and... I'm going to. I'm sorry, but sorry, I'm sharing. sorry about no, that. Cool. No, these things well, happen. We want um, to see the pictures that you're describing. Of course. Um, let's try this one more time, and I hope you can see this now. What yes. is a black hole? What is a black hole? Yes, we're on that slide. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. So the next question is to ask ourselves is what is a black hole? And in particular, um, how does it interact with its environment? So uh, these are Einstein's field equations that you see here. They're pretty nasty at first glance, but actually very, very elegant in nature. And so the left hand side here you can think of as space time and the right hand side you can think of as matter. Hmm. Sorry, my slides are again not changing. And so Einstein's realization is to reformulate the, the laws of physics in a, in a covariant framework. So it's a, a framework independent of a, a choice of reference frame where space and time are, uh, are treated on an equal footing and woven into a, a four dimensional fabric. And his realization is that the fabric of space-time, the structure of space-time, uh, is, is proportional to the matter that exists within it. So matter would be stars, dust, gas, us. Uh, and there, there, there's a feedback, this proportionality. So if you curve space-time, then you, you cause a localization and, and 
for example, an increase in density of matter and vice versa. If you compress matter, then you have space time locally too. And a black hole is actually a vacuum solution to this equation. So when the right hand side is zero, you just have this left hand side space time. A black holes are vacuum solution. So it's not actually in matter per se within general relativity anyway, but it's, at, it's, it's simply a, a curvature of space time, which leads to, a, to an effective mass. And it's a bizarre concept, but nonetheless, so far, it seems to, to, to be uh, verified experimentally. And so black holes are very simple objects, incredibly simple objects, actually, and can be characterized in terms of just three parameters, their mass, their spin, so how, how rapidly they rotate, and an electric charge. And actually electric charge that we, we can neglect, particularly for supermassive black holes, because even if a black hole were to be imbued with some electric charge, it would reach neutrality with the surrounding plasma. So it's really just two parameters that we have to consider as far as the black hole is concerned. Now, the black hole itself, there are a few interesting regions that we should touch upon first. And the first one is the event horizon itself. So the event horizon is, uh, the, the, is effectively the boundary of the black hole and is what defines the black hole itself. Uh, so anything which crosses it uh, is, is forever trapped and causally disconnected from the rest of the universe. Inside is a singularity. Uh, this singularity um, is probably a, is, 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 a, is a failure of the equations in their description of the black hole, and that can only be reconciled through things like a, a quantizable theory of gravity. And that's something which is an outstanding issue, and it's not relevant to what we're discussing, simply because we can't see beyond the event horizon anyway. Just outside the event horizon, we have a photon sphere, and this is a region where light rays can actually orbit the black hole multiple times. Um, and so this region is unstable, so they're unstable to perturbations, but light can orbit a black hole. So if you were to stand at the edge of this photon sphere, you'd see multiple images at the back of your own head. Uh, moving outward still, you have the innermost stable circular orbit. And this is a region which defines the edge of where matter can move in stable uh, circular orbits. And that's important because that matter, uh, which is part of the accretion disk, uh, produces radiation that we want to detect. Uh, and the accretion disk itself, and actually um, it's wonderful to have seen the, the talk by Cassandra because she's actually done a wonderful job of explaining accretion disk theory already, so that saves me a lot of time. Uh, the accretion disk itself um, is the source of radiation. So of course a black hole traps light, and so we can't see a black hole directly, directly, but we can, we can uh, resolve uh, radiation produced by the matter at the very edge of this event horizon. And that's the aim of the EHT. And finally, we do have relativistic jets, which I won't have time to talk about today. Um, and we do see them, of course, in many AGN systems. And we believe that they're connected to the rotation of the black hole and how the black uh, and magnetic fields that are, that are in this uh, accretion flow and how those interact with the black hole uh, itself. So I'm going to have to exit and go again because it's frozen. So the next thing I wanted to show, what I've presented so far is just a simple picture. But of course, because light is severely bent by the intense gravitational field of a black hole, um, what you observe is not necessarily what you're used to. That is to say, light being severely bent does some very strange things. So in the following, you've seen a light ray past the red circle in the center. That's the horizon of the black hole. As those light rays get closer to the event horizon, they're uh, deflected through greater and greater angles. Now, if we rotate our field of view so the blue mesh is a, is a sort of uh, embedding of space time, um, you, you can fire more and more light rays. And as we approach a sort of continuum limit and we record these uh, at a distant observer on a CCD or a photographic plate, you can obtain an image. Now, in, under the simple approximation that this matter is uh, uniformly distributed, it's uh, isothermal, isotropic, all the rest of it, the simplest possible approximation you can make, you get the following image. You get a circular a dark shadow with an intensity profile at the edge that drops off at roughly one over distance squared from the center. And we call this the black hole shadow. And this is basically the lensed, uh, the lensed uh, uh, unstable photon orbit. So it's like the capture cross section of the black hole itself. And this is a defining feature of black hole images. Now nature, sadly, is not so simple. We have to work a little bit harder to build up what would be a realistic black hole shadow image from uh, an actual astrophysical black hole and in the next few slides, this is what I'll, I'll, I'll show. So imagine for now that we put a simple thin accretion disk around the black hole. So it's a geometrically thin and optically thick accretion disk. And it's, a, it's in the equatorial plane of the black hole. So the black hole is spinning about the vertical axis. And we're an observer inclined at some angle line. And we're recording light rays 
uh, or photons which arrive from this uh, accretion disk. Uh, we collect them and actually because of the strong gravity of the black hole, some of those light rays which are produced uh, much closer to the event horizon of the black hole undergo significant deflection. And so you actually have different parts of the image. You have direct images and you have higher order images. And some of these, these photons, these light rays can actually orbit the black hole multiple times before they're received. And so if you imagine looking at, at, at a thin disk edge on, an annulus, you would see just a, a thin line, which would represent the thickness of that annulus. But looking at a, an annulus edge on, if it's around a black hole, so a thin accretion disk, you see the following image. You see a, an apparent warping of the rear side of the disk. And, uh, and that's the upper part of the image that you see here. And you see an apparent warping of the rear underside of the disk, and that's the smaller lobe on the bottom half of the image. So this is actually a geometrically thin two-dimensional structure uh, for, for just for simplicity to, uh, to, to demonstrate this but you see nonetheless a very strange uh, gravitational lensing of the light. So you, you're seeing as apparent warping, it's not a physical warping. Now, the first actual calculations of this were performed in 1978, published in 1979 by Jean-Pierre Luminet. And he made the following image and each pixel is a calculation on the supercomputer of the day. And of course, supercomputers back then were less powerful than what we have on wristwatches today. So it's a painstaking calculation, but he performed the first accurate image. So you see this asymmetric brightness because the black hole is rotating. So that matter is spinning towards us and it's Doppler boosted and it's very bright. And conversely, the receding side is dimmed. Now, um, we can go a little bit further these days and we can actually include uh, much more complex uh, accretion structures. So, accretion disk material that's moving around the black hole. So, what you see here, I've just taken a black hole that's rotating quite rapidly uh, and you see a dark shadow and I've just put a lot of stars from observational data and mapped them onto a celestial sphere and you see this background illumination of the black hole shadow. You see it's a sort of not quite a circle, it's asymmetric because it's spinning. Now of course we can, we can put a real accretion flow in there and so if we superimpose that there, this is what you see. So now you don't see the shadow properly, you see part of the dark region, you see this obscuring front limb, and you see this turbulent structure where brighter colors pink through to white uh, are, are um, hotter material. And this is uh, at, observed at radio wavelengths, this is synchrotron emission. And you can see it's a, a much more complex uh, picture and it's actually time dependent too. Um, now, in terms of spin in the black hole shadow itself, uh, in the following movie, um, what you see in the top left here is the magnitude of the, of the spin of the black hole. And this can range between zero and nearly one. And what you see in the bottom, uh, uh, the bottom left is the size of the event horizon of the black hole itself. And now on the right, you'll see the shadow boundary curve. So this is like the, the last orbit of photons that move around the black hole. Now, as we play the movie, we gradually increase the spin of the black hole. So it's rotating more and more rapidly. You start to see the shadow becomes more asymmetric and shifts to the right. Now you start to see the event horizon shrinking in the bottom left and you see the shadow almost forms a dimple as we reach the most extreme parameters. So the, the, the size of the shadow itself is somewhat dependent on the inclination angle and also on the, on the spin of the black hole. Okay, now one of the things that we do is we actually perform time dependent general relativistic magnetic hydrodynamics simulations of how this turbulent matter moves around black holes. I'll show an actual simulation shortly, but this is a post-process radiation transport calculation of this in full general relativity, where we have to take into account the properties of the intervening medium, we have to um, take into account this, the, the curvature of the space-time, absorption and emission processes, polarization, sometimes scattering too. And you can make an image. And in fact, you can, you can, you can change your orientation. So this is what the, the black hole would look like at an angle of 60 degrees with respect to the rotation axis. But as we move the observer inclination around, we can fly around the black hole, you see the distribution of brightness changes. So when you're at more edge on inclinations, you see a bright approaching side and a dim receding side. When you're face on looking down the spin axis, it looks almost uniformly bright. And so in this particular movie, the black hole is spinning very rapidly. And these different, this differential brightness, this asymmetry is a result of Doppler, uh, Doppler boosting. So there are transverse Doppler effects when they're edge on and just general Doppler effects. And of course, we also have gravitational lensing, which is what's causing the, warp, the warping of this toroidal structure. So uh, in general, once we've determined how we calculate images, we, we have to determine how we're going to actually potentially observe a, a, an accreting supermassive black hole source. And for this, what feeds into these images, so hopefully at this point you have some idea of the crazy things that light can do around a black hole, we perform these simulations 
And generally, and I won't go into all of this, we start with an equilibrium distribution of matter. We perturb the magnetic field. And over time, uh, an instability, the magnetic rotation instability develops. Accretion is triggered. And through the processes of angular momentum transport, amongst others, uh, you will form a turbulent accretion flow. And over time, magnetic field within that flow is wound up and jets are produced and launched. And there are two of them. There's a bipolar jet. You just see the one that's coming more towards us. And you get a, a, a turbulent accretion flow. And this is the source of our, of our modeling. And of course, this thing varies in time. And this is for a choice set of parameters for a particular black hole spin, magnetic flux, and so on. Okay, and that's frozen. And the key thing here is to understand what's happening on a microphysical level. And so what the Event Horizon Telescope does is it, it tunes in to the, uh, to the particular frequency of radiation that's produced. And of course, this is synchrotron radiation that's produced by the gyration of three electrons in this hot, extremely hot turbulent plasma as they gyrate in our magnetic fields, field lines. And this produces radio waves, which we can detect here on Earth at a particular uh, frequency, which is 230 gigahertz. And so the, 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 the EHT is a set effectively tuning into this particular frequency. And there are two main things that we can play with here. So there's the size of the telescope and there's the observing wavelength. And the resolution uh, that we, we, we can achieve is effectively proportional to the ratio of the size of the, of, of the telescope and the observing wavelength. And of course, bigger is better for size and shorter is better for wavelength. But of course, there are issues with building larger telescopes. And actually, when you push the shorter wavelengths, you can resolve matter closer and closer to the edge of the event horizon. So you start to see the structures become more optically thin, uh, and you start to resolve the shadow of the black hole itself. And measuring this actually gives you a constraint on the mass of the black hole. Now, the, the achievement of the event horizon telescope collaboration was in actually performing this measurement. And to give you a sense of the scales involved here, the uh, EHT itself is, is, you know, it, 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 it's an interferometer. And for comparison, the size of the moon is uh, roughly half a degree on the side, sky at full moon and the closest and so on. Now, the size of the M87 uh, photon ring, the bright ring feature in the center and the bottom left is around 40 micro arc seconds. So this is around 190 millionth of a degree. And the EHT has actually achieved a resolution of around 25 micro arc seconds, which is nearly a factor or two better. Uh, smaller than the size of the, of the photon ring. So this is actually equivalent to resolving with the naked eye um, an orange on the surface of the moon from Earth. And so what the EHT does is uh, records uh, these interferometric wave patterns that are, that are recorded at various telescopes around the world. And of course, all this data has to be synced using atomic clocks and it's recorded individually and it needs to be shipped to central sites. But over time, so you see here on the left, the Earth rotating, you see that there are periods in time where there's no data being reported at all. In the middle, you see the UV plane, and the aim of the game in all of this is to try and cover this, this space. And you can see it's a very sparse coverage. And there are certain telescopes within the interferometric array, which, array, which form triangles, which lead to better uh, or sharper image reconstructions. And it's not that you want telescopes as far apart as possible. That's great, because if you have two telescopes further apart, then you resolve the structure closer to the event horizon. You also want good coverage at intermediate baselines as well. And so the EHT has had to work with very sparse data and reconstruct these images. And so here's just, a, just a, the coverage that we had over all four days of M87. And I know I'm running out of time. So ultimately, what we tried to do is compare theory of observation. So here's a time dependent movie of this. And ultimately, you can pick a snapshot, one which fits very well, data, and when you can evolve this with the observing beam you get things which are actually very, very close to what we observe. And there are many, many such images which fit the bill here. And it's difficult to discriminate on this basis. Um, when we're simulating these things, there are a lot of things that we feed in. So we pick a black hole mass. Um, we have to choose an observing information angle, jet orientation angle. We have constraints on extra luminosity and jet power. And we actually, as a team, built an enormous library of uh, not just simulations of how matter moves around, different black holes, but also the, the, the images from this. So this is what we call general relativistic radiation transport, or GRRT. And there are many input parameters here. And we created a library of these, hundreds of thousands of, of images. And all of these could be a potential realization of the state of M87 as we observed it. Um, and just three quick examples. So just to tell, show you just the breadth, the plethora of models that we have, 
So on the top left, you see a model with a negative spin, a model in the middle top with zero spin, and a model in the top right with a large positive spin and a very different high magnetized state of accretion. All three of them fit the data quite well at that particular snapshot in time. So it's very hard to, to constrain on the basis of these alone. Uh, and it's actually very hard to constrain spin too. So it seems like things are a little bit depressing, but actually there's a lot of promising stuff too. And my slide. Bit more to change again. Here we go. Hopefully this comes through. But what we do see is a robust ring feature. And this is important because the photon ring is a strong field prediction of GR and is proportional to the mass of the black hole alone, especially for M87, since we're viewing it nearly edge uh, face on. And so the position angle of the peak brightness is also pretty consistent in, uh, from day to day in these images as well. And this is reassuring because this actually enables us to put a mass constraint. And so if you go into the visibility domain and you look at visibility and amplitude plots as a function of baseline length, uh, what you see here is basically the Fourier transform of an annulus. So it's just a modified bezel function and you can fit these data. And these data fitting for the known distance to within the error of 0.8 megaparsec, you uh, can actually extract a mass. So wrapping up, because I'm really out of time here, uh, what have we learned so far? And I'll come to the mass. Uh, so this is the image itself and superimposed to, I think it's from XKCD. Uh, you see the solar system. So the, the central brightness depression here, which is roughly coincident with the event horizon, is actually larger than the solar system. That's the sense of, of size and scale and magnitude of this black hole. It's absolutely enormous. It's six and a half billion solar masses. Um, and so just concluding, what we found is, and this is a totally independent uh, constraint on the mass of six and a half plus or minus 0 0.7, with a small a systematic error, billion uh, solar masses for this black hole. Uh, by fitting the, 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 this annulus, this ring that we observe in the data. We, we, we just use general relativity to do this. We haven't looked at gas dynamics or stellar dynamics or anything like that. And this is consistent uh, with what, what's known so far. And this is actually a nice uh, confirmation of Einstein's theory of general relativity. And I hope this is the last time that I have to exit and come back again. Uh, and we can actually make um, a lot of, um, of interesting statements about other theories. So, for example, you see a central brightness depression and only something that probably without a surface um, uh, can explain this. So black holes have a, a pronounced central brightness depression, uh, but some objects like boson stars and other hypothetical compact objects don't. And so they're excluded immediately on this basis. And finally, I'll just leave this slide here. I'm terribly sorry because it doesn't want to transition. What we see that the results are broadly consistent with GR. And so the, the shadow size and shape itself, as well as its substructure, are actually uh, very sensitive to space-time geometry. And in the, in, time, in the years to come, we'll actually be able to constrain these further. So one of the things that we want to do is to look at, okay, now it's changing, that's wonderful, is to actually uh, look at the black hole in our galactic center. Um, and that work is ongoing, and you should hopefully hear from us very soon about this. And I think this one is even, even more interesting since this is our local black hole. It changes much more rapidly than M87. So the dynamical uh, properties of this are fascinating. Um, we want to push the shorter wavelengths, of course, because if you push the shorter wavelengths, then you can actually resolve uh, matter uh, and, and emission much closer to the event horizon. We want to have more telescope sites on Earth so that we get a basic coverage and coverage in the UV domain, and this will lead in lead to better images. images. And finally, there are mission concepts in place and the papers that we've written both as a collaboration and that we've also written as a small teams on uh, the prospects of uh, interfer interferometric imaging of black holes using space-based telescopes, extending these ground-based arrays. And this can, of course, lead to much sharper images. You can have long-term monitoring. It's not just a few hours per night, across a few days per year, and so on and so forth. And so, I'm terribly sorry for the uh, technical issues throughout my talk today, but I hope that you leave with uh, some feeling of what this image actually means now. Uh, and in time, we hope to have sharper and sharper images, not just of, out of M87, but also Sagittarius A star and many other black holes besides, and have a much better understanding of their dynamical properties. And so I conclude by saying, um, this picture was actually taken in uh, Hilo, Hawaii in 2019, just before Christmas. Uh, on behalf of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ziri. That was that was really fantastic. I'm sorry you've had some issues with your slides. It seems we have technical gremlins all around today. 
but you've communicated a really difficult subject in in such a clear way and I really appreciated the sort of visualizations and you know the explanations to go with it of, of that of that image um, so I've learned a huge amount so thank you very much for that for that talk um, I think we have uh, now I think Shona has had to leave I'm still here so I can ask one I can ask one really quickly but then I'm afraid I have to go that's fine would you like to do that Shona We've had a couple of questions, but yeah, again, such a clear talk that I think, yeah, we've already really learned something and you've answered a lot of the questions as you went along. So the first one um, is from Phil Diamond, who our very own Phil. Um, and he just asked, when might, we see, when might we see an image of another black hole? <laughs> so that is a million dollar question. Uh, thank you for your question, Phil. Um, I'm not at liberty to say, but uh, what I can say is very soon. Okay, that's good. Um, Shona, thanks for hanging on. I know I know you um, needed to leave. So um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, just a comment to say two brilliant presentations. I think it's really good to pass that on. I totally agree. Um, Q says you'll never think of an orange in the same way again. Um, and the comparison with Voyager at one position, and I thought exactly that was really, really helpful to, to give some context to that. Um, I'm just going to ask a really quick question, if I may, as I don't see any other questions at the moment. Oh, no, we do have one. Let me, okay, I won't ask my question. So there is a question on, um, so how did Luminant create the first image of M87 black hole? What kind of math, math Mathematical methods did he use? Sorry if I haven't pronounced that correctly. No, 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 no problem. Uh, that's an excellent question. Mm. So Lumine, um, so this is the late 70s. So it's, it's been well understood how, how um, geodesics, so uh, trajectories of particles or massless particles like photons actually, uh, how they're mathematically defined in general relativity. There's an there's equation that you solve, it's called the geodesic equation of motion. And what he did is he solved this equation of motion for light rays and he put a, a black hole there. And he said, okay, let's just have a simple thin disk of matter. It has a particular emissivity profile. And he fired lots and lots of photons at this disk, a little bit like the image I showed earlier on in my talk. And he was able to, to calculate this by running each each particular light ray, which constitutes the pixel in the image that you saw on the supercomputer. I, I know it took many hours per pixel, and he used uh, India ink, uh, I think on uh, Canson uh, negative uh, photographic paper or plate even, and it was he took the negative of the ne negative of this. So I think this took him many many days to weeks to actually to mm -hmm. actually uh, to complete. And it was published in a popular science magazine in Paris in 1978 and subsequently in a journal in 1979. And this was actually just an image of a generic black hole. And one of the things that I neglected to mention in my talk was that because black holes are so simple, there's an almost scale, there's a scale invariance. So if you double the mass of the black hole, you double its size. So whether it's a, a stellar mass black hole or a supermassive black hole, as far as that shadow is concerned, uh, it, it always looks the same. Okay, so I'm just going to ask one very one more quick question that's come in from Mike Edmonds. Will there be quantitative data on the magnetic fields? Hi, Mike. Um, thank you for the question. Yep. Uh, the, the short answer is we already do have some quantitative data on the magnetic fields. So it wasn't um, something I had a chance to touch on today, really. But we have published two papers, uh, April this year, on the uh, polarization of the light that uh, we detected in M87 from these same 2017 data. And what we found briefly um, is, um, is something very interesting about the topology and orientation of the magnetic field, as well as its strength in M87's accretion disk. So what magnetic field information does is it allows you to, to as polarization information, I should say, sorry, it gives you uh, a means to constrain the, 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 the the topology of, of the magnetic field. And by doing this, what we found is that it's mostly in a toroidal configuration. So a lot of that magnetic field is swirling around the black hole. And there's a beautiful image, which I wasn't able to show today, where you can actually see uh, the magnetic field almost being dragged onto the event horizon of the black hole. Mm -hmm. And um, what's more exciting about this for me as a, as a sort of physicist and theoretical astrophysicist is that with these 
data. So you don't get one parameter, total intensity, you actually get four parameters, uh, Stokes parameters, You're eight, and you can determine things like linear and circular polarization. So you can actually uh, constrain the models that we have from these simulations I showed you in these libraries much, much more strongly. And you can make some very nice statements about the state of the matter uh, around the black hole. It's almost certainly what we call a magnetically arrested state. So it has a very high magnetic flux onto the event horizon. This is important because it explains things about variability and the time scale over which these things happen. And I could go on and on. Uh, please check out those papers. Uh, they're really great papers. Absolutely. That sounds fascinating. Thank you so much. Great question. Thanks, Mike. OK, I think we better draw this to a close this evening. Um, it's been really fantastic to hear from both of you today. Thank you so much for your talks. Um, just to close the meeting then, um, to give notice that the next monthly uh, ANG meeting of the Society will be on Friday, the 14th of January 2022. Apologies again for the technical issues at the beginning. Um, of the meeting and I just wanted to thank you all for coming today and for your continued support for the RES throughout the year. Um, it's hard to believe that we're, we're at the end of another calendar year um, and still meeting virtually and I just wanted to wish you all um, a very pleasant and relaxing festive season. Please look after yourselves and I wish you all the best for 2022 and I hope to see you in London at some point next year. Thanks everybody.